Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of Disability Chat. Each month, HDSA and our resident disability expert, Allison Bartlett, will tackle some of the most vexing issues surrounding Social Security disability and Huntington's disease. Today, we will be talking about completing disability forms, an overview of what Social Security disability forms you will receive during the disability application process and how to complete them. You can send a question at any time during the presentation. Just click on the chat function in the toolbar, type your question, and hit send. Your questions can't be seen by others, only by HDSA. This presentation will be available in about a week on HDSA's YouTube channel or by going to hdsa.org forward slash disability chat. Beginning on September 17th, Disability Chat will begin a new series on advanced planning designed to provide information about what HD families need to consider in the areas of disability, health insurance, and other legal requirements based on where the individual is in their HD journey. On our September Disability Chat will focus on what at-risk and gene-positive individuals need to know to prepare for prodromal presymptomatic HD. On November 19th, the chat will explore what individuals need to know to prepare for early stage HD. And on January 24th, our chat will talk about what you need to know to prepare for mid to late stage HD. Allison Bartlett is HDSA's Manager of Disability Programs and is a disability attorney who specializes in representing clients with rare chronic conditions like HD to navigate through the complex disability system. Allison holds a JD from the University of Cincinnati College of Law and a BA in International Affairs from James Madison University. And now I'll turn the chat over to Allison. Thank you, Deb, and thank you everyone for joining me today. As Deb said, today we are going to be discussing disability forms. So there are a number of different disability forms that you may receive while your disability application is pending. And I'm going over a number of different forms today. This is not a complete list of forms because the forms are sent out by Disability Determination Services. And that department is actually state run in every individual state. So different states have different forms. These are just the main forms that I have seen the most and that I actually had examples of. So the first form we're going to talk about today is the work activity report. So who receives this form? Anyone who is still working while applying for disability, and this includes people who receive a W-2 and people who are self-employed. And again, in order to file for disability, you must be earning less than $1,260 per month. If you are self-employed, Social Security has a different standard. Uh, I can't tell you exactly what that is because their rules are very complicated and they don't share everything. But if you are self-employed, what they ask is if you are netting more than $400 per month. So you don't have to include your gross income if you're self-employed. They look at your net income because you have expenses through your business. So when would you receive this form? Generally, you'd receive it within two to three weeks of submitting your disability application while it is still at your local field office. So as a, just so everyone knows, when you submit a disability claim, it goes to your local field office first. Your field office is determined by your zip code and where you live. The field office processes all of the financial information. They make sure you have work credits and they make sure you're not working over the limit. Once they've determined the non-medical requirements are met, then they send your case to disability determination services. So this is the only form we're gonna talk about today that you would receive before your case gets sent to disability determination services. So what needs to be included in this form? You need to include a detailed account of income received, which is different from work earnings, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, you need to include a detailed account of your work earnings, a detailed account of your medical expenditures if you have any, and you need to include your pay stubs. The deadline to complete this form is usually 10 to 15 business days, and once this presentation is over, you'll be able to access the work activity part directly on this link that I have provided. So what we have here is the very first page of the work activity report. If you get sent in the mail, you'll have a few cover pages. This is the actual first page that you complete. 
and there's a couple of different sections. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but there's parts of the forms that would be filled out already by Social Security, like name of the claimant or beneficiary, the Social Security number, the claim number, etc. So what Social Security is asking for on this part of the form is they want to know if you've received any other kind of income that's not directly related to working. So did you have any vacation pay left at your job that they paid out? That does not count as work earnings because you're not actually working. Vacation pay, holiday pay, sick pay, those things don't count as work earnings because they're a benefit and you don't actually have to physically go into work and perform your job tasks to get paid from those things. So that's why it's counted as a different kind of income. So if you received anything from your former employer or your current employer, this is where you would put that information or if you've received any kind of insurance payment, workers' compensation, or anything else. You want to be as specific as possible. If you can't remember the exact amount or the exact details, then include that information in the remarks section at the end, which I'll go over in a few slides. So this is the first page. The next page is where you're going to start your actual job information. So if you are still currently working, you need to include your current or most recent employer's name, your supervisor's name if applicable, the mailing address and the location of your job, and the job title and the work that you did, the dates that you started your work and you ended your work, or if you're still working and how much you're getting paid. So with this form, they include spaces for you to put in the earnings amount, it would be better if you actually had your pay stubs. You need to do everything in your power to collect your pay stubs if you're going to keep working while you apply for Social Security Disability because that is the most effective and easiest way to show that you are working within the income requirements. Because um, you want, and the reason for that is you need to be as accurate as possible when you're completing this form. It could jeopardize your disability claim if you over or underestimate your wages. So if you're going to keep working, you need to have access to your pay stubs and you need to be able to print them and submit them directly to Social Security. Um, and the form has a section for like five or six different jobs. I'd be really impressed if you're applying for disability and you have six different jobs at the same time, but there's room for a lot of different employers on the form. The next section of the form is asking you if you had any help while performing your job. And it's extremely important to complete this section of the form thoroughly and accurately. Do not leave this section blank. If you have HD and you're still working, but your symptoms have started to impact you, you are likely receiving some kind of assistance in one of these different ways. So you have to be open and honest about the accommodations you receive at work or the changes to your ability to work. You need to be as detailed as possible. If you run out of room and the please describe your condition, your why you need help box, then continue your answer in the remarks section. That's why there's a remarks section. Um, if you are not honest in a section of the form and you overstate your ability to work, Social Security will think you can continue to work and will deny your claim. When you apply for disability, what you are arguing is that you can no longer work. You no longer have the ability to work full time without assistance or accommodations, and that's why you should be found disabled. So if you say, if you don't check any of these boxes, and you say you can work normally and you can perform all of your job tasks just fine and you have no issues, why would Social Security find you disabled? Why would they have a reason to find you disabled? For a lot of cases, especially in my experience with families with HD, HD individuals who do work tend to have fewer or easier job duties than other people. They're allowed to produce less work than other workers. Um, they take more rest periods than other workers. So those are some of the things, they work a regular a fewer hours than other workers. Like those are some of the things I see commonly. And so if that's the case for you, you need Social Security to know that because they're trying to find if you can actually work or not. And they won't make an accurate decision if you don't give them all of the accurate information. Um, another section on the form. So let's say it does take longer than two to three weeks to get this form. Social Security includes this section in case you have made work changes since you submitted the disability application. 
Again, answer all questions honestly and be as detailed as possible. So if you were working when you submitted your disability application, but let's say it actually takes you a month to get this form and in that month's time you decide you really can't work anymore, then you would indicate you stopped working, you'd indicate from what job you stopped working at, and you would indicate why. And then in the remarks section, this is just extra space provided on this form that lets you give more detailed answers. Because if you actually go through and you look at the form, you're not given a lot of space to write your answers and you wanna be as detailed as possible. I always say, I don't think there's anything, I don't think there's such a thing as giving too much information to social security. Um, and I always tell everyone, take all of the space you need to answer the questions right on the back of the form. If you have a lot to say, then say all of it. And if you have to add extra pieces of paper to make sure you can say everything you need to say, do it. But again, um, so this was the work activity report. You will only get this form if you are actively working when you filed your disability application. And you will get this form if you have, if you get a W-2 or if you are self-employed. The self-employed form looks a little different, but it's, it's pretty much the same. And if you have questions about how to fill out this form, you can contact me directly or you can contact Social Security because if you've, oh my goodness, if you've been sent this form, it means you've been assigned a caseworker in your field office and you should contact your caseworker directly, especially if you have questions about when the form is due or if you need an extension. So the next form that I'm gonna talk about is the adult function report. Almost every individual that applies for Social Security Disability receives this form. This form gives people so much trouble and difficulty because the form is not well written. It's not a great form and it doesn't ask questions in the way that maybe people really understand or can really fully answer. And so I see so many people struggle on this form. When I was representing clients directly, I would have to redo this form the number of times I had to redo this form with clients was high and I don't want people to make those mistakes and so I'm going to give you a very detailed overview of how to complete this form pretty much section by section. Um, I don't go over every section because some of them are more straightforward but again if you have questions and you receive this form you are more than welcome to contact me. So when do you receive this form? You receive this form when your case is sent from your local field office to Disability Determination Services. Usually, in a lot of cases, it's automatic. So as soon as your claim is sent over to DDS, before anyone at DDS even looks at your case, you'll get sent this form to complete and send back. And the reason you get sent this form is because Social Security wants to know about your activities of daily living. Often, your medical records don't really include how your symptoms and limitations of your HD impact your activities of daily living. So Social Security needs this adult function report along with your medical records to get a more accurate picture of how your disability impacts you. So what needs to be included in this form? Detailed descriptions of your activities of daily living. Limitation, which includes limitations you experience because of your HD and changes you have made to your life because of your HD. Usually the deadline to complete this form is 10 to 15 business days. Social Security really has to bring the hammer down on these deadlines because a lot of people don't ever send back these forms. If you don't send back this form to Social Security, you're already putting your case off at a disadvantage and there is not a good reason to not complete this form. If Social Security sends something to you, you better complete it and you better send it back. Otherwise you are jeopardizing your disability claim. While Social Security on its face is very strict about these deadlines, if for some reason it takes longer for you to get it in the mail, if you just need extra time to complete it because you've been struggling to complete it, call your like call the phone number that is going to be attached to the form and ask for an extension. In most cases, they will give it to you. If you are making a good faith effort to complete this form, but you just need some extra time and you say that, they are likely going to grant you an extension. I have asked for so many extensions over the years, they were always given to me, but it was also because we had good reason. So don't be afraid to call Social Security and ask for an extension if you need one. And again, when this presentation is over and it's been added to the website, you can access the adult function report with this link. So some general tips for the adult function report. 
always complete this form from the perspective of a bad day. If you are the one with HD, get help completing this form to make sure it is detailed and accurate. Because it can be difficult to complete this form, sometimes it takes a long time. It can be mentally exhausting. Trust me, I've been mentally exhausting after, exhausted after helping people complete the form, so it's okay if you get help. Have someone complete the form for you if you cannot do it yourself. The form at the end does ask if someone completed the form on your behalf. Make sure to explain why you need help completing the form or why you were not able to complete it. And the person who helps you can be the one who says that. Do not undermine or understate your symptoms. Do not make it seem like you are better than you are. Do not say you can do things you can't do because that's not painting an accurate picture to social security and they're gonna deny you. And then if you get upset and wonder why you were denied, but you say you can do all these things you can't actually do, then that's a reason. You have to emphasize what you cannot do anymore. This form can be very emotionally difficult for people to complete because you really have to look at the things that you struggle with. You really have to look at how HD has impacted all areas of your life. That is not fun. I do not wish that on anyone. I hate having to have these conversations with people. But if you're not accurate, if you don't really look at what has changed, if you're not honest on this form, you are doing your disability claim a disservice. And I don't want you to get denied if you rightfully deserve disability because you didn't full fill out the form to the best of your ability because it was emotionally difficult, because it was scary, because it was hard. Um, and it's all, and again, if you have trouble, I exist so I can help you ask, so I can ask the questions. I can help you kind of understand your limitations better to get there because this is not an easy thing to do. You will likely run out of space in a section, so use the remarks section and add as many pieces of paper as necessary to thoroughly complete the form. As we will go through the adult function report, you'll see there's not a lot of space to answer a lot of these questions. And I definitely recommend having a friend or family review the form before you submit it to Social Security because they may notice things, may, they may notice symptoms or limitations you don't, they may notice something you missed, and you want to make sure you have a very detailed form. So this is the adult function report. This is what you're going to see if it gets sent to you from Social Security. And again, they'll have information like your name and your Social Security number filled out, and then you'll fill out the rest. So the very, so this question is from page one. Um, people start having issues from the moment they start completing the form. So the, how do your illnesses, injuries, or conditions limit your ability to work? In my experience, this question is not answered with a lot of detail or it's not answered accurately. Um, so you always need to include why you are not able to perform, to work or perform activities because of your HD. So I have two examples. Example one, my HD has made it impossible to work or do anything else. This terrible disease has impacted every area of my life. Okay, does that tell you anything about that person's symptoms or limitations? Do you have any actual idea why that person can't work? I can't, I don't. So if I worked for Social Security, what am I going to actually understand about this person? Nothing. So then we have example two. My HD caused me to stop working because I couldn't keep up with my job tasks. I forgot how to perform parts of my job that I had done for years, like, and then I would give good examples. Um, as an attorney, maybe I would say I forgot how to perform job tasks like I had trouble writing briefs that I had always written or I had trouble utilizing the research databases that I had used for years and I started having issues getting along with my coworkers. Working eight hours a day is too much for me now. I have to take multiple breaks during the day because I cannot concentrate on my job and I get brain fog. I'll leave it up to you to decide but really one of these answers is much better than the other and provides a lot more detail. Social Security is never going to see you face to face. The people who are reviewing your claim will likely never see you. So everything you want them to know, you have to write on paper. This section, while it seems pretty straightforward, people still have difficulty. Like, do you take care of anyone else, such as a wife, husband, children, grandchildren, parents, friends, or other? Um, you take care of pets or animals. Does anyone help you care for people or other people or animals? 
a lot of people don't like to admit when they need help with in this area, especially if you have children and you now have difficulty taking care of your children. If you have children, you need to be extremely honest about the level of care you actually provide. Do not include tasks if you cannot do them anymore. If you only provide love and emotion support, and emotional support, it is important to indicate that on this forum. You need to say things like that. If you need help preparing meals for your kids, you need to indicate that. Um, if your spouse is the one who's become the primary caregiver of your children, why and what do they do? You need to be detailed and indicate all of those things. Um, and I know this is especially hard for moms, but this is something that resonates a lot with Social Security. It resonates with the individuals at Social Security. It resonates with judges. Like, because if you now struggle to take care of your children because of your HD, that's a huge indicator that you also cannot work. And nobody wants to admit that. No one ever wants to have to say that. But in this context, because the only people who can see your claim are Social Security, they cannot release this information to anyone else. They cannot release it to any other government agency. The only people who are going to see this is Social Security, and they need to have the full truth. If you have children or pets that you help take care of, I would always check yes that you need help caring for them because help comes in many forms. It comes in daycare, babysitting, friends or family members coming over during the week, after school programs. There's a lot of different things you may not think on the surface or help, but count as help. If it means you get a break from taking care of them or you get time to do something else that you need to do, it just, it all counts as help. And you do have to stress what you cannot do even if it is emotionally difficult to discuss. <sighs> this is my favorite question on the adult function report. That's sarcasm, if you couldn't tell. Um, this question trips up so many people. So many people check they have no problems with personal care. Under no circumstances should you ever check that box. And if you can check that box because you have limitations with personal care, then there may need to be a discussion about why you've applied for disability in the first place because it might have been too soon. So in my professional legal experience, by the time someone's submitting a disability application, they have some kind of limitation with personal care, even if it seems something that's so minor. So if you have difficulty using buttons or zippers, that's enough to put on the form. So you have trouble getting dressed or maybe now you have to sit down because your balance is a little off and you don't trust yourself to put on pants while standing up. Maybe you have to put sit down to put your shoes on now. Maybe you had to switch to Velcro shoes because you have trouble tying your shoes or you just wear pull-on shoes. If you have trouble brushing your hair, if you need reminders to bathe or shower, if you need a shower bar or a shower stool, and I know that's might seem more advanced, but like things that we consider to be little things still matter. Maybe now you use, have to use a specialty toothbrush because you can't use a traditional one because you drop it. Can you shave yourself? Or do you have, help, have to have help to get someone else to shave you now? Have you grown out your beard because you have trouble shaving? All of those little things matter and they all add up. So it's important that if you've submitted a disability application that you do not check the box that you have no problems with personal care because you likely have made some, even if they are minor changes and those need to be included in this section. Um, so next questions I've seen issue with, do you need any special reminders to take care of personal needs and grooming or do you need help or reminders taking medicine? Check. Yes, if you use any kind of reminder, including but not limited to a pillbox, a phone alert, a calendar, or a spouse or family member. I admit, I use my phone all the time now for reminders. So yes, I need help with reminders. And that's something that I think like we kind of, because it's become a common occurrence to use our phone with these things, we don't necessarily think about it. But if you're using your phone for reminders of any kind, if your spouse or family member has to help you with things a lot, that needs to be included in this form. Meals. This is another section that definitely trips people up. So do you prepare your own meals? You need to be very specific about the meals you prepare and eat. Cooking a meal from scratch is very different from reheating leftovers, eating cereal, or um, heating up a frozen meal from a box. So give details. 
or maybe now you only make smoothies, or maybe you used to make big meals for your family, but now you can only use a crock pot, or now maybe you burned yourself using the stove so you only feel comfortable using the oven. Those are all important details. Um, you need to be specific about how your ability to cook has changed if it has. Can you follow a recipe from start to finish? Does it take longer to cook? Do you have to cook simpler meals? Do you forget to turn off the stove or oven? Have you had any cooking accidents? Like have you cut or burned yourself? And then if say, and it's, maybe you never liked to cook in the first place. Fine, there are plenty of people who don't like to cook. Um, but maybe if you didn't like to cook in the first place for one set of reasons, but now like you also know, like I don't like to cook, but I also now I know I couldn't cook because of these things, that's important to include too. So again, being as detailed as possible. And as you can see, there's not a lot of space to answer these questions. So when you're answering these questions, you're likely going to need to use the remarks section and add additional pieces of paper. House and yard work. As someone who has all of my faculties and hates doing these things, I am always amazed at the conversations I've had with people who struggle day in and day out to do chores in their house, even though it is so incredibly difficult for them to do so. Um, I cannot tell you how to live your life. I think chores are dumb and I hate them. That's my personal preference. But if you do continue to try every day to do chores, but you've had to make substantial changes, it's really important to include that information. I would argue only include chores you are actually able to complete on this form. So before you used to be able to clean your house top to bottom, no issue, but now the only things you can do is maybe you can vacuum, you can help put the dishes in the dishwasher, and you can help do the laundry, then only include those chores. It would be good to say as, to show how changes happen, that you used to be able to do all these things, but now you only can do the three things. And let's say those three things take you a lot of time. Let's say you can do laundry, but you often need reminders to move laundry from the washing machine to the dryer. And you have to take breaks when loading the dishwasher because your hands will get tired and you don't want to drop and break anything. Or let's say you used to be able to vacuum the entire downstairs of your house in less than an hour, but now it takes you three hours because you can only vacuum one room at a time and then you have to take a break. Using that kind of detail is really important and stressing that you have to take breaks during activities is really important because if Social Security determines that you need multiple breaks in a day, that is considered an unreasonable accommodation for employers and there's no job that exists in the regional or national economy that you could do, meaning you would be found disabled because you cannot work. Um, another question that people have a lot of trouble with 17, are you able to pay bills, count change, handle a savings account, or use a checkbook or money order? Only check no to these things if you're having cognitive difficulties with any of the items listed above. Social Security is not interested in your inability to pay because you do not have money. This question is really asking if your cognitive ability to do these things has changed. And Social Security asks these questions to determine if you are capable of handling your own funds. If they think you cannot handle your funds safely, they will recommend a representative payee. So that's why they ask these questions and that's why it matters. Um, if your ability to handle money has changed, you really need to explain how and why. Maybe you're not able to use a credit card because you overspend and you've racked up a lot of debt and you can't manage it or keep track of it because out of sight, out of mind. Um, maybe you have trouble making change when you pay cash and you can't pay in cash anymore. Um, there are a lot of different examples. There's a lot of things I've seen over the years. So be detailed and specific. And if you are able to still handle your funds, be detailed and specific about that. There are plenty of individuals who are no longer able to work for various reasons, but are very much able to handle their own funds and can receive their own disability checks. Another question that trips up a lot of people is hobbies and interests. So what are your hobbies and interests? How often and well do you do these things? Describe any changes in these activities since the illnesses, injuries, or conditions began. So in listing hobbies, you need to include past and present hobbies. 
it is important to include past hobbies so you can describe why you cannot do them anymore as a result of your HD symptoms. Maybe you used to be an avid cyclist or you rode your bike all the time, but you can't do that anymore because you have issues with balance, so you had to stop riding your bike. Maybe you used to play a musical instrument and that became too hard because you couldn't read music anymore or became too difficult to use your hands. Definitely don't say you can ride a bike if you haven't ridden a bike in three years. And it'd be stressful and maybe not the best idea to ride a bike. Like do not overstate your ability to complete hobbies or interests in this section. Um, be very detailed and specific about any struggles you have completing your hobbies or changes you have made. So in my professional experience, often um, at the point people were submitting disability applications, by the time they were submitting a disability application, they had had to leave behind a lot of their hobbies and interests. And one of the only things they would write is if they would watch TV. Watching TV became a very common hobby. Cool. One, but when you're watching TV, think about can you pay attention during the entire TV show or do you lose track of the storyline? Do you have to watch episodes over and over again? Do you have to restart the episode? Do you have to pause it and come back to things? Because if that's the case, it's really important to make sure Social Security knows that because it means you have difficulty with concentration and attention. If you are off task from a job more than 10% of a time, you cannot work. 10% of the time is not very much. Some days, we're all, we all have those days, you know, we all have those days like at work where you're trying really hard to be productive and for whatever reason you just can't, you know you're off task more than 10% of the time that day. It happens. But if you're off task more than 10% of the time every day, that's essentially one of those qualifications that Social Security has found you cannot do any other work. So if you have trouble watching an hour long TV show, let's say you get about 20 minutes, maybe you get about 40 minutes through and then you struggle the last 20 minutes that's being off task more than 10% of that TV show. Another thing, do you read? Have you changed what you read? Did you used to love reading long novels and now maybe you can only read a magazine article or things on the internet because you can't concentrate that long? That's a really important distinction and that needs to be included. So just, again, it's important to list all all hobbies might be a lot, but like your main hobbies past and present, so you can show how things have changed. Because really, especially with Huntington's disease, what Social Security is looking for is how your life has changed as a result of your HD diagnosis and your symptoms and your limitations that you experience as a result of your HD. Um, another important question is, do you have any problems getting along with friends, families, neighbors, or others? It is important to answer these questions honestly. Irritability is common with HD, and I've known a lot of people who have developed like social anxiety or other anxieties, and so they stop going out or they stop interacting with people or just people, some, you know, people aren't always the nicest. And some sometimes when you have a diagnosis like HD, other people don't understand and they fall by the wayside. There are things that happen, but it's important to talk about that because having difficulty interacting with others is one of social security standards for finding someone disabled. If you have trouble interacting with others, then you're going to have a difficult time working. Most jobs involve human interaction with supervisors, coworkers, or the public. Of course, I'm giving this presentation during a pandemic where all of that is not as accurate right now, but we still like, even if you work from home, you still have to communicate with people on a daily basis. Usually you have to check in, you have calls with coworkers, you talk to the public, they're re like you interact with people. And so if you have difficulty interacting with supervisors, coworkers or the public, there are very few jobs, if any, that exist that allow you to have almost no human interaction. So if you know you struggle interacting with people, it's really important to be detailed here because that's a reason to be found disabled. Section D. People also have a lot of trouble with this section um, because they'll check a number of boxes where they have limitations, but then they don't provide a lot of detail as to why. So for every box you check, this is a new rule I'm instituting for everybody, for every box you check, you should write a sentence explaining how your HD impacts that specific ability. If you check all 19 boxes, then you should have 19 sentences. That's probably like an overstatement. There are certain things you could com probably combine, like 
completing tasks and concentration. There are things that could probably be grouped into a sentence, but bare minimum, like if you check all 19 boxes, then you should probably have at least 10 sentences. Otherwise, you're not doing an adequate job describing your symptoms and limitations. Some questions to think about. Do you struggle with balance or in coordination? Do you trip or fall? If you are a fall risk and your past work experience has been in construction, would there be a construction company that would hire you if you were at risk of injuring yourself and others every day? Those are kind of things to think about. Do you drop items? Do you have trouble starting tasks? Are you able to finish tasks? Are you able to concentrate to get through an hour long meeting? Like it's really important to include as many examples as possible. When it comes to this form, there is no such thing as too much information. Um, this section also trips people up because it asks how far can you walk? How long can you pay attention? Do you finish what you start? How well do you follow instructions? These questions can be difficult to answer because we do not think about our day-to-day -day lives in these terms, but it's good to use your best guess for concentration or attention. I like to think about it in terms of TV shows or movies. Can you concentrate for a 30, 60, or 90 minute show? Can you sit through a one or two hour movie? Do you get distracted while watching a show or can you follow along the entire time? With instructions, this includes directions, rules to a game, how to assemble furniture, etc. Can you follow all the steps? Do you have to read the instructions multiple times? Can you follow along to spoken instructions or do you always have to have things written out? Um, and then for assistive devices, if you use any kind of assistive de assistive device included in this section. So that includes a shower bar or shower chair, a non-skid bath mat, special eating utensils or straws, electric kitchen tools. So often one of the symptoms of HD is having difficulty speaking and having difficulty swallowing. And so if you have difficulty swallowing and you've had to change your diet or you have to use straws now to drink, it is important to include these aids in this application because that stuff does matter. Um, if you used to always use a hand can opener, but now you have to use an electric can opener because you can't, so you have to have a machine do it for you, it's important to say those things. There are a lot of accommodations people make in their lives when they have a disability, and because it becomes their new normal, they forget about it. That's why I recommend having someone help you with this form, because that isn't their new normal. So they can be like, hey, well, don't you do this thing? Isn't that different than what you used to do? It's really, it's all about the little differences because it's all the little things that can add up and make a huge difference. You don't have to say like, you can't walk anymore. It doesn't have to get to that level. You don't have to say you can't remember anything anymore. Like that's not the standard. It's all the little things that go together to add up to find someone disabled. And then another important thing is if you are taking any medications and you have side effects include all of this medicines and side effects. Social security considers your side effects as part of your impairment. So it is very important to include all of the side effects caused by your medications. Not necessarily as relevant to Huntington's disease, um, but there were some disease states that I helped with where people would have to take a diuretic. A diuretic makes you go to the bathroom a lot. And that's a negative side effect. And so let's say you have to go to the bathroom at least once an hour every hour during the day. Well, those count as unscheduled breaks, and that adds up to being more unscheduled breaks than what an employer might be willing to accommodate. And so it may not seem like it's a big deal, but again, all these things add up, so put all the information. You may not think it's relevant, but you, what you think isn't what's really important. It's what Social Security thinks when it comes to a disability application. Here's their mark section. Again, there's not a lot of space here. So if you're filling out this form thoroughly, you should be writing on the backs of pages or adding additional pieces of paper. Um, and again, if the person with HD is not able to complete the form, indicate who completed the form and why the person with HD needed help. The next form is the third party adult function report. So this pretty much looks exactly like the form we went over, but it's gonna be sent to a friend or family member of someone who applied for social security disability. Again, this form gets sent out when the case is sent from the field office to DDS, what needs to be included in this form. 
all the same things, detailed descriptions of the HD individual's activities of daily living, their limitations they experience because of their HD, and the changes they have made to their life because of HD. Again, deadline 10 to 15 business days, and you'll be able to access this form when this presentation is posted. The same tips apply. Um, again, this form is exactly like the adult function report, but it's asked from a third person perspective. So instead of what can you do, they'll ask what can he or she do? Like, it, so if I'm the one who applied, if I, Alison Bartlett, applied for disability, the adult function report, it would ask what I can do. If somebody gets a third party report, it'll ask what can Alison Bartlett do? Um, and one thing that's important is the person with HD will not see this form. Like it is sent directly to the third party individual and sent back to social security. And I know there are experiences, there are, there are circumstances where someone with HD may not have a lot of awareness or insight into their condition and they may not be willing to talk about it. They may get angry, they may get upset. Um, and the third party form, like this is not something you have to show them. And if in order for you to be honest, you can't show them the form, then don't show them the form. Because if they really need disability, it's important to be honest. Otherwise you could just, oh my gosh, jeopardize the disability claim. I would like everyone to say jeopardize the disability claim five times fast because you will likely mess it up too. Um, but again, here's an example of a third party adult function report. As you can see, it looks very, very similar. Um, and everything I went over on the adult function report applies to the adult, the third party adult function report. So now I'm going to move on to the work history report. This is another form that is commonly sent out. So who receives this form? Anyone who applies for social security disability and is over the age of 35. There are some exceptions. You might get it if you're younger. Before they would only send the form out if you're 50 or older. I, so it's hit or miss when they send it out now, but I just, if you're, over the age of 35, you might get this form. Again, you get this form when it, your case is transferred from the local field office to Disability Determination Services. So what needs to be included in this form? A detailed account of your past job history, detailed account of job tasks and work performed, detailed account of why you stopped working, and you need to complete all of the sections of the form thoroughly. I also highly recommend including a resume if you have one, because that already has a lot of your job tasks and what you did on it. And so it provides additional information in addition to what you'll add to the form. Deadline 10 to 15 business days, and you can access this form after the presentation. So this is what the work history report looks like. So on this first page in the job title, like in the section where you're listing your job history, when completing your job history, start from your most recent job and work backwards. List the name of your employer instead of the type of business. I don't like the type of business column. That's not helpful. I think it's more helpful to actually list your employer. And if you still want to list the type of business, then list both. You need to include the month and the year when listing dates worked. Including just the year is not enough. Sometimes the form comes with instructions, sometimes it doesn't, but after working with Social Security for years, their internal policy is they need the month and the year. I'm not making this up. I've had to refill out forms many, many times. They need the month and the year when listing dates worked. Um, it's okay if you do not remember exact dates used your best guess. Job title number one. So for every job you fill out on this form, you're going to have to fill out more detailed information. Um, so this is, the, this is what you'll see at the top of the form. So rate of pay. Use your best estimate of your wages. If you were paid hourly, then include your hourly rate. If you had a salary, include your yearly rate. If you were paid monthly, use your monthly rate. Um, average the hours and days worked per week. Not everyone works the same number of days or hours per week, so provide an average. You can provide greater detail in the remarks section. So if you are an hourly employee, some days you work, some weeks you work 40 hours a week, you know, eight hours a day, five days a week. Some days you work six days a week. Some days you work 12 hours a day. Just average it out. Social Security is looking for an average. So use your best guess. And 
describe the job, you need to provide a thorough overview of your job tasks. And if this was your last job before applying for disability, include details about how you started to struggle working because of your HD symptoms. And utilize the remarks section if you need more space. It is really important to list all your job tasks and then, be, and then say, I started having trouble with these tasks in these areas and this way, and that's why I decided to stop working, or that's why I was fired, or that's why I was forced to retire. Social Security needs that information. So this section of the work history report trips up so many people because Social Security doesn't always include their instructions. Aren't they wonderful? Um, so we're going to go over this today. In the, so in your job, did you use machines, tools, or equipment? technical knowledge or skills? Did you do writing, complete reports, or perform duties like that? Almost everyone uses some kind of machine, tools, or technical knowledge in their job, so at least one box should be checked. Like, did you, were you trained to use a cash register? Did, like, most jobs require you to have some kind of knowledge, skill, or use equipment? Um, so for most people, one of those boxes should be checked, yes. And then in this job, how many hours each day did you blank? This section trips up so many people. It's not clear the way this is written out. Like Social Security needs to do a better job with this form, but they don't. So that's why we're having this conversation today. So really this needs to be broken up into three different sections. So in combination, it should be how many hours did you walk stand or sit and that should equal eight hours or the average number of hours you worked per day. So if you had a predominantly sedentary job, let's say you sit seven hours a day, you stand half an hour and you walk a half an hour. That's all one section. And then in combination, how many hours do you climb, stoop, kneel, crouch, or crawl? At most, this should equal eight hours a day or an average number of hours you worked per day, but this can be less. If you have a sedentary job, you're not likely climbing, stooping, kneeling, crouching, or crawling very often. As a disability attorney, I really never do those things. And the one time last week I stooped under my desk, I banged my head on my desk. So I will try to avoid stooping from now on. Um, and then the last thing in combination, how many hours do you Use your hand to hand, oh, do handle, grasp, or grab big objects, reach, write, type, or handle small objects. This is something that should equal eight hours a day because most of us in our jobs are doing some combination of this. So walking, sitting, standing should add up to eight hours. Handling, reaching, writing, typing, or handling small objects should add up to eight hours. But climbing, stooping, kneeling, crouching, and crawling, depending on the nature of your job, can add up to eight hours, but it's possible you do those things for less than eight hours. And if you have more questions about this, you can always give me a call. And then lifting and carrying. Social Security always wants to see that this section is filled out. You need to be specific about what you lifted and carried, including if you do not lift and carry anything at all. So I used my job as an example as a disability attorney. I rarely lifted and carried items. I carried my computer to hearings, and when I participated in education days, I carried paper resources that did not weigh more than 10 pounds. So I would say check the heaviest weight lifted is probably 10 pounds and check weight you frequently lifted would be less than 10 pounds. So if you didn't really lift things as part of your job, say that. Otherwise, be specific about what you lifted and carried. If you were something like a nurse or a doctor or an EMT, um, lifting people is something that happens a lot. Be specific if you lift like, but in most of those cases, you're not lifting them alone. So yes, you maybe lifted a 200 pound person, but if it was a gurney, if there were three other people involved, it's important that you say that. You don't want social security thinking you can just go around lifting 200 pound people every day, all day. And then last part of the job section, do you supervise other people in this job? It is important to include details about your role and job tasks as a supervisor or lead worker if that was your, that's the role that you had and to add more detail in the remarks section. You want to include if you now have any kind of difficulty working with others or include if you had any altercations with coworkers, supervisors, or customers. Um, and Social Security gives you like 
eight pages, you can fill out the detailed information for up to eight jobs. And then again, just here's the remark section. If you need help completing the form, this form can be completed by someone other than the person filing for the disability claim. And always use the remark section to the fullest, like this thing should be filled up. You should never submit a blank remark section. Um, so another questionnaire that you could get is a physical limitation questionnaire. Who receives this form? Certain states send out this form to individuals who applied for social security disability and allege physical limitations. Physical limitations is something that is common with HD. This specific form um, is from Illinois. I don't know what other states fill out, like send out this form. I'm sure there are other states, but I know this specific form is specific to Illinois. When do you receive this form? When your case is sent from the field office to DDS. What needs to be included? Again, detailed descriptions of your physical limitations when completing activities of daily living, limitations you experience because of your HD, and changes you have made to your life because of HD. Deadline to complete, 10 to 15 business days. Um, so the physical limitation questionnaire, be as thorough and detailed as possible. This questionnaire is only two pages long, so it's a really, it's brief. It's sent along with the adult function report. Um, and it's just asking more specific questions because the adult function report is really general. So you wanna provide examples of instances you have struggled with any of the tasks included and write on the back of the form if you run out of from providing your answers. I filled in some examples. The form specifically says to only fill in things that you have trouble with. So using kitchen tools. I do not use knives anymore because I drop things a lot. My grip has also gotten weaker, so I have trouble using a can opener. Um, dialing the phone, picking up a coin, using a pen or pencil. This should probably also include using a cell phone, but these forms have not been updated in a very long time because, you know, just like Social Security is antiquated, so are all their forms. Um, so it is important that even though it doesn't say anything about a cell phone to include issues that you may have using a cell phone. So as an example, I have trouble holding pens and pencils. My hand starts to hurt after 30 minutes and my handwriting is terrible. I have trouble texting and I hit the wrong letters a lot. Like, again, if you have trouble using your cell phone, if you have trouble typing, that is all stuff Social Security needs to know. Um, another example, carrying bags or groceries. I used to be able to carry five to seven full grocery bags at a time, but now I can only carry one in each hand because I drop things and my hands are weaker. So these examples provide detail. Like it says what, your lim lim what the limitation is and how it's impacting them. Um, this is the second page. So, if you are unable to sit for more than two hours at a time, that is a huge indicator to Social Security that you would have trouble working. So if you have trouble sitting for more than two hours, be very specific as to why. Um, and if you have to take multiple breaks during the day, that is also a huge indicator to Social Security that you would have trouble working. Multiple breaks per day is considered an unreasonable accommodation for employers, so no one would have to hire you, which means you couldn't work. That's like some of these questions may seem silly, they may get repetitive, but there's a reason Social Security is asking them. They have very specific criteria that they're looking for. So if you have trouble sitting for more than two hours at a time, you have to stand up and walk around. There's a number, like maybe you have to lay down, maybe sitting up is physically exhausting. Like whatever the reason, if you fall into any of these areas, be as specific and detailed as possible. Another, this is not necessarily related to headache, HD, this is a headache questionnaire, but I'm including this to show that you can have other conditions that you put into your disability application and you might also get sent forms that deal with those other conditions. So the headache questionnaire, who receives this form? Certain states send out this form to individuals who indicated that they have headaches. This particular form come from Indiana. Again, it, you get it sent it when your case is sent from the field office to DDS and what needs to be included, a detailed description of your headaches, limitations you experience because of your headaches and changes you have made to your life because of your headaches, deadline to complete, 10 to 15 business days. So this is what the headache questionnaire looks like. Um, I am fortunately not someone who suffers from headaches, so I don't know all the different kinds of headaches, but there's a lot of different kinds of headaches that you can be diagnosed with. And so if you have more than one kind of headache, one kind is a migraine, if you have other kinds, you have to complete the form for all the kinds of headaches you experience.
Yeah, and this form is pretty straightforward because it's asking very specific detailed questions. So just answer the question. How long does a typical headache last? If it lasts anywhere from two to four hours, you need to say it lasts anywhere from two to four hours. Like just be as specific and detailed as possible. Like what did you tell your doctor to get a diagnosis? That's the kind of information that you should have on the form. Um, another form you could get sent is the additional contact questionnaire. Many states send out this form in order to obtain additional evidence from friends or family. So sometimes what will happen is you'll get sent an adult function report that will include the adult additional contact questionnaire and then someone on this list will get sent a third party adult function report. Again, you get it when your case is sent from the field office to DDS and list any friends or family members who know about your HD and how it impacts you and who you would be willing to and who would be willing to complete this form on your behalf. The people you include should be people who have a good understanding of your limitations caused by your HD symptoms. Do not list your doctors. And again, 10 to 15 business days to complete. This is what the form looks like. It's very straightforward. And then again, do not list your doctor on this form. And some other questionnaires I've seen over the years in client cases, but I couldn't find examples of pain questionnaires and anxiety questionnaires. So these questionnaires ask specific questions related to your pain that you may have been diagnosed with. What if you have chronic back pain, um, you've had issues with your spine, you have leg pain, whatever reason, like if you indicate that you have chronic pain in your disability application, you might get this questionnaire. If you indicated that you've been diagnosed with anxiety, you might get an anxiety questionnaire that's asking specific questions about your anxiety, how it impacts you, what symptoms you're experiencing. And so the same level of detail we've talked about in all the other forms need to be included in forms like this as well. So general tips. Do not lie on these forms. Under no circumstances do you ever lie on these forms. Do not overstate your limitations. Do not make it seem like your HD symptoms are worse than they are. And do not understate your limitations. Do not make it seem like your HD symptoms are better than they are. The symptoms and limitations that are described in these forms need to be similar to the symptoms and limitations documented in your medical records. And this is why it is important to be honest with your your doctors about your HD symptoms and limitations. No, you don't have to like get a copy of your medical records and look at what your doctor says to make sure it all matches up, but it's just, it's important to make sure that you're telling everything that you tell your doctor, like everything you want to include in the form is also what you tell your doctor. Because if you don't, if you fill out the form amazingly and it's super detailed, but you've never told half that stuff to your doctor, Social Security is going to get skeptical because they're going to say, well, you think you're worse than you are, but your doctor says you're not that bad. And they do compare those things, but it's important to know that. Um, the deadline, they, again, Social Security is strict on the deadline. The deadline starts from the date on the letter. So not the date you receive the letter, the date Social Security puts on the letter. And so if for some reason the mail is really slow or your letter gets misplaced or you get the letter and you only have two days to complete the form, call Social Security and ask for an extension. Let them know like, hey, this letter is dated this date, but I literally received it today. In those circumstances, they're likely gonna grant you an extension. And call the number on the form, not your local field office or the national number. They can't help you. Once your case is sent to DDS, the field office can't help you. And the more information you provide on the form, the more helpful the form will be to your case. Questions? Okay, well, that was absolutely fantastic, um, Allison. I certainly learned a great deal about applying for disability and will be able to answer some questions that uh, come to me. We do have uh, two questions. The first is um, uh, regarding a pension. Does a pension count as income? My husband works for the FAA and has to retire because of HD. To earn a disability retirement, he has to apply for Social Security. So a pension does count as income, but it doesn't count as work earnings. So you or your husband would be allowed to apply, like to get his pension and apply for Social Security disability. Those two things don't impact each other. Okay. Uh, another question um, is uh, about, um, my husband worked in his last job for 30 years. Does he still need to give detailed information for the jobs he had before then? 
That's an excellent question, and I realized now I wasn't clear. Social Security really is only looking for your past 15 years of work history. So in this case, if your husband worked at that job for 30 years, you would only need to give a detailed description of that job. I think it would be important if like he had promotions and things, like if his job title changed along the way, you want to give like those different job titles and those different tasks and responsibilities over the last 15 years. Um, to give an overview because like, I'd be very impressed if he did the exact same thing for 30 years but you want to make sure that Social Security knows he can't do the job that he like had to leave or any of the other jobs that got him to that point. We have another question. Can your spouse fill out the third party adult function report? So in most cases so let's again say I, Allison Bartlett, and the one who had applied for disability and most cases, Social Security would send a third party adult function report to my husband. Um, and so in some like, let's say I couldn't fill out the form on my own behalf, then it's possible that my husband would have to fill out my adult function report and he would have to fill out his third party adult function report. But yes, spouses can definitely fill out the third party adult function report. And in most cases, if there is a spouse, that's who Social Security sends the form to. Right. Okay, well, I see that we're just about out of time. Um, thanks again, Allison, for this really fantastic edition of Disability Chat. I want to remind folks that our next chat will be on September 17th. So please join us and uh, both the presentation today and the materials that Allison has presented will be available uh, first on uh, YouTube, this presentation on YouTube, and then the materials will be on the HDSA website. So um, if you have any questions, you know, please do ask Allison in addition to her email that is appearing on the screen right now. If you go to the HDSA website, there is an Ask Allison button that you can push to send her your questions. Thanks again, and we hope to see you again in September.